Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Zach Woods, who's sitting next to me right now, is, in my opinion, hands down one of the funniest people in TV and movies today. You can now see him in the movie Downhill, as well as in the new Armando Iannucci show, Avenue 5. And I said, he's sitting right here. Give him a big round of applause. Zach Woods, everybody. <laughs> I don't know why I'm clapping. This weird sort of whale clap. But also, at the risk of sounding ins insufferable and obsequious, I feel like I've had this conversation with a number of actors, which is that when you're doing press for something, this, with you specifically, is like an oasis where you get to have a conversation that is uh, gratifying and interesting and fun, and, and I hope you know that you are beloved among people who don't love doing press all the time. So I just wanted to say that on, on, uh, on the record. Well, thanks so much for stopping by, Zach. I think we can end the interview there. That's great. No, that's so nice because yeah. I, uh, I feel like the one thing that I have going for me in this is that I gen genuinely feel bad for people having to do press. Well, and you seem to genuinely care about uh, movies, television, writing. I mean, you're, you, you radiate curiosity in a way that is quite nice to be on the uh, receiving end of, as opposed to s the sort of blank bovine stare of somebody who is waiting for a much better <laughs> celebrity to come through the door, <laughs> which doesn't happen that much, but once in a while. Uh, like a 46-year-old man from like a Miami local spot who's just waiting to ask if he can get a selfie. Oh, <laughs> that guy, honestly, Instagram. I would like. A Miami guy, like a middle-aged Miami <laughs> Man who wants a selfie is, I feel like we would have a lot of um, sexual tension between the two of us. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, talk to me about Downhill. It's uh, uh, based on the uh, Ruben Oslin film Force Majeure, but uh, kind of a, I don't want to say a different take, but a different tone than I think Oslin does with, with, with Force Majeure. How did you get involved? Had you seen the original? Yeah, I saw the original and I love the original. I found the original extremely funny and very disturbing. It's a very queasy sort of a movie. Someone told me that like for that movie, often couples leaving would get into fights because for those of you who aren't familiar with the original Dan Hill, um, it's the same premise is this one, which is that a family's on a ski vacation and they're having lunch outside and it's very idyllic and Austrian. And then there's an avalanche um, which starts to approach them and gets closer and closer and closer. And at the last moment, the father and the family gets up and grabs his phone and runs away, leaving the mother and her two children to sort of cower and be consumed by a snowy death. But then uh, it turns out it was a controlled avalanche and no one is hurt. And the father sort of slinks back to the table and the rest of the movie is them dealing with the emotional fallout of this sort of catastrophic emotional discovery that in... When it counted, he fled. Right. Um, so uh, I love the movie and the adaptations written by Jesse Armstrong, who wrote Succession and also were, uh, wrote the first movie I was ever in with Armando Iannucci called In the Loop. And um, Oh, Jesse was one of the writers on that movie? Yeah, Jesse was one of the writers. It, Armando Iannucci has this whole sort of British comedy mafia of like Tony Roach and Simon Blackwell and Georgia Bridget. I could go on and on. But um, there's all these incredible writers who co-write. You know, that was your first stuff. movie? Yeah, that was it. What was your audition like? for that movie? Because I do feel like, sorry, I don't mean yeah, to interrupt, yeah, no, that, uh, that movie kind of changed your life in a way because it was mostly seen by people who make stuff, right? It's oh, the kind so of movie yeah, that's that right. is not like, it, it was playing at IFC, it wasn't like a, ma a big mainstream movie, but anybody who liked comedy and liked movies that I knew would see, saw and talked about that movie for, for, for months afterwards. And so I feel like it was from that you got probably The Office and you got right. a number of other roles. Yeah, it was a weird experience for a variety of reasons. One being that, well, first of all, the whole thing felt so miraculous. That movie starred James Gandolfini, and I was like a big Sopranos fan. And they flew us to London. And I don't know if you guys know this, but like, as part of the union agreement with SAG, if they fly you across an ocean, they have to put you in business class. And I had never, ever been in a business class seat before. And it is grotesque. I mean, it's like it's like a it's a chic like existence for eight hours. And I was this I couldn't afford. I was eating like cheese that I found like deep in the fridge from like the previous tenants. Like I had no. I was just you know like scrapping. And so all of a sudden I was like flying over the Atlantic Ocean, looking down from my like weird ice cream sundae that I was like hoarding because I knew that they were gonna take it away from me when they realized I didn't belong there. And then I got to London and it was this hero of mine, you know, James Gandolfini, and he was so warm and sweet and supportive. And I would literally walk around London 
crying because I felt so overwhelmed with joy and gratitude. It seemed like such a miracle and still seems like such a miracle, to be honest. Um, to get to be in something at all is... is alone something that had like an impeccable script. It's, inc- it's crazy. It's a crazy thing. And we were staying in this like weird... 19th century Victorian hotel and they flew my dad out to visit and it was just this like sort of fantasia of like amazing things um whereas like most people coming from UCB or coming from the comedy world their first role is like a bit part in like paddled out two or something (laughs) you know like some (laughs) yeah it was just like I just hit the jackpot and then you're right like there's this thing that people say it was like how do you make God laugh make plans you know but I remember when I was shooting that movie, I had this fantasy where I was like, what if Allison Jones saw this movie? And Allison Jones is this casting director who basically has created the people who do comedy now. It, she cast Freaks and Geeks and The Office and, I mean, Azillion Veep and all these different shows. And I thought, what if she saw it? And what if she liked me and put me in things like The Office? And then I flew to Los Angeles and I had a meeting with her and she said something that people in Hollywood sometimes say but never seem to mean she looked at me and she went I'm gonna help you and I was like okay and then she got me a job on the office I'd never been in anything she got me I didn't even audition she just got me the job how had she seen in the loop yeah she saw in the loop okay and then I moved out to LA and I was like, I don't know where to live. I was living in this weird basement where the the, the beams were too low. So I, I was constantly kind of like body rolling through my own apartment because I kept banging my head on beams. And it was like, like a I mean, I already kind of had one, but it just accentuated what had already begun. And then she was like, well, I have an empty condo and I'll give it to you for next to, for a song. So then I was staying in this like beautiful old condo. It sounds almost seedy, right? You would think like, well, where's the- Where is, where's the twist here? I'm still waiting for it. It's never happened. She never came to collect. Like she could be like, okay, now it's time. I've like, I've like killed a lot of old ladies and I need you to help cut up their bodies and throw them in a swamp. And I'd be like, done, you got it. But she's never cut up any old ladies or of needed you know, me to. As yeah. of right now. Yeah, she's never come to collect. She only, and I've talked to so many people people who have had this experience with Allison Jones where she's just been their fairy godmother who's come in and been like and now you are a real boy you know do you think it's because she saw a talent in you she saw something that she liked and she thought she felt like if I could foster this then he can get on his way and you know we can keep he can keep working I think she is yeah I I don't know I hope so I hope she saw talent I mean I I think Talent and also probably like a nice person. I think I I think um, I think casting directors fall into two camps, and most of them thankfully fall into the first camp, which is people who genuinely are rooting for the people who come into their offices and who want them to thrive and want to pair people with the parts that are great for them. And then there's people who have sort of a little bit of power, and have become seduced by that and enjoy wielding that sort of modicum of power. And that's pretty unpleasant if you walk into one of those offices. And she, more than anyone, embodies the first kind of, where she's just on your side, across the board, and on the side of the project. Um, So I don't, yeah, I guess this is a long rambling answer that doesn't actually answer your question, but I, I don't know what she saw, but I'm, I will be forever indebted to Allison Jones. And that puts me in the company of like 700 other actors who feel the same way. And you smartly never asked why. Yeah, I think if you start asking why people believe in you, that, that way lies madness. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. my problem. I'm always like, why are you doing this nice thing for me? Explain right. why you like me. I don't understand this. I'm a piece of shit. And then it goes, <laughs> and, and, then it, and then whatever they were trying to do goes away. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, right. What am I doing? Exactly. It's like waking someone out of a dream. Like, like someone's sleepwalking and giving you a massage, and then you're like, wake up, wake up. And they're like, oh. Ah, I don't want to yeah. touch you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope Allison Jones never wakes up from her sleepwalking massage of all of those who have benefited from them. Was it from the office to Silicon Valley? Or was there, yeah. like, what was I did what Veep. It? I did a few episodes right, of Veep, and I did a show called Playing House. But, yeah, that was the next, like, real, like, solid television and you guys uh, just wrapped that up yeah uh what six seasons seven seasons six seasons six seasons what was that like ending it 
It was nice in a way. It was sad. I mean, I was so sad that it was ending. It was heartbreaking. Right. But it was that good heartbreak that tells you that you had something of value. You know, I mean, loss, as painful as it can be in the moment, alerts you to the fact that you've had something to lose, you know, I think. Right. And so the sort of it's proportional in a weird way. The pain of something ending is proportional to the gratitude that you feel for having had it in the first place, hopefully. And I also think like the first three years of that show, I was just having a like a 900 day panic attack where I was just like constantly worried that I was gonna come up short, that I wasn't gonna be good, that I was the weak link, blah, 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 blah. Just insecure, 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 really? yeah. But around year three, I became an insufferable shithead. <laughs> I, no, no, I started, I just you started, started pointing I, out the other said, weak hey, links. <laughs> I'm actually pretty goddamn great. No, I, uh, no, then I started to just relax. I just thought, okay, well, look, if they wanted to fire me, they would have fired me by now. If these guys didn't like me, they would have started being mean to me by now. I just started to feel like, okay, I'm, I'm okay here. And the second I stopped feeling sort of narcissistically terrified. You got lazy. I got lazy. Yeah. And I got money hungry. Yep. I started collecting Corvettes <laughs> and small bags of cocaine, which are surprisingly expensive. Uh, a multi-level marketing <laughs> scheme that you were running on the Silicon Valley set. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, predatory lending uh, business. <laughs> um, but no, once I calmed down a little bit, then I had the, the insecurity was replaced by a different thought. And that thought was, oh, this is impermanent. This is going to go away soon. Even if it goes for 10 seasons, that's still pretty soon. It's going to go away. And these sets aren't going to be here, and these people aren't going to be here. So once I calmed down enough not to be hyperventilating all the time, then I started to just be like, all right, look at these people. Look at this. Like, enjoy it, because it's going to be gone. And I was glad that I calmed down early enough that I was able to take some of it in before it ended. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I'm curious what made you so insecure in the first two or three seasons, because right from the beginning, you were written about as a standout on uh, on the show, and people talked about you as the kind of secret weapon of the, of That's the show. That's very sweet. Well, I never read anything that anyone writes about anything I'm in because I, I'm so prone to... Right. You know, whatever. It's just you don't want to... For a couple of reasons. A, I'm sensitive about that stuff. But also, if you read someone's comment, even if they're a total schmuck, if it's a negative comment, it will lodge in your brain, and then you will adjust your performance based on some, like, lunatic who's, like, sitting at his lunch break, like typing some shitty thing into his computer. Like, you're, you're accepting direction from a faceless asshole yeah. and you don't want to do that because it'll make you worse at your job you, does that make sense yeah, that makes perfect sense yeah um so and i also even if you're handed a stack of glowing positive reviews you are probably because most actors most performers are like this i think most people are like this you will pick out the negative thing oh, within for sure. there and hold on to that and the rest of the glowing stuff will be like who cares yeah, this if, is the thing. If someone said, we're going to give you a box of caramels, but one of the caramels is going to be full of spiders and dog shit. And <laughs> you wouldn't eat that box of caramels, even if all the other caramels were really good. Or if you ate it by accident because it was hidden and you didn't know, you wouldn't remember that all the other caramels yes. were the best caramels you've ever had. Yes. You would only remember that you ate spiders and dog shit. <laughs> That's exactly right. The story isn't like I had a great box of caramels. The story is someone tricked me eating, into eating spiders and dog shit. They gave me all these beautiful caramels, <laughs> and then they gave me one of spiders and dog shit. What's Why wrong with that? that guy? Russell Stover needs to change their uh, their marketing. But um, yeah, and then also, even if you do believe it, the good stuff, that's also dangerous because this, then you start doing an imitation of what you think people like about you, and that also leads to bad news bears. So I think um, I never read anything, and also it's sort of connected to the feeling of flying to England where it's like, no one really deserves a career. I mean, yeah. in a way, you know what I mean? It's like, I'll take it. Um, I think I'm good enough, you know? Like I, I, I work hard and I try to, you know, I care about the things I work on and I, I try to be professional and, and do a good job. But no one really deserves to like stay in an old Victorian building and like, improvise with James Gandolfini. It's like, so it's, you always feel a little bit like, I don't know, a little suspicious. And then eventually you start to realize you're like, well, 
this is how it panned out. So may as well, it's sort of a sin to not show up for it at a certain point. Of course. If you're so suspicious of it that you don't enjoy it and make the most of it, you're not doing anyone any favors. If you have so much merit anxiety about yourself, you may as well do something else. You know, if you can't commit. I can't quit. imagine yeah. another career that warrants mer more merit anxiety than <laughs> acting. Yeah. Simply because, as you said, like, you, you are an, uh, an extremely unique performer. You're, you're very good. You're extremely funny. But there has to be moments where you feel like there are, I, you probably know lots of yes. other people who you think are funnier than you. And sure. you're like, why aren't they in yeah. this position that I'm in, you know? Like, yeah, and I think you can go overboard in the other direction, too. It's like... like that you are the you are the funniest person in the world. <laughs> no, I've never no been at risk for that. No one deserves this but me. <laughs> no, but you can also... There's There can be... It's, it, Self-deprecation taken to a pathological extreme is its own kind of ego, I well, think. I know. Right? Yes. If you're constantly kind of like, I'm not worthy, um, it's just like, all right, well, then leave. Like, either yeah. do it or not, you know? So I think it's like you have to kind of dial that in. You have to be like, okay, I'm not going to... I'm not going to fall for thinking that, like, this is my manifest destiny, but I'm also not going to spend so much time looking at all my blemishes in the mirror that I could never go to the dance, you know? Yeah. Imprison yourself in a, in a way. Yeah. 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 Um, when it comes to uh, Downhill, Nat Faxon and Jim Rash did something that I think is really interesting because the original Force Majeure is a dark kind of austere comedy and very quiet. Mm -hmm. And I think people are going to be expecting with Will Ferrell and Julia Louis-Dreyfus and even you to for this to be a kind of big, broad version of that. Yet it remains fairly small and contained and, and subtle. What was it like doing per a performance like that? Man, it was so exciting, largely because I'm such a fan of these... These two rats. Um, you worked with Will before? Yeah, I had. I Which, worked with him on The Office. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, and... Uh, it's funny, before I worked with him, I always would watch those old SNL sketches, you know, Cowbell or whatever, and then and, and people would laugh. And I'd always be like, don't laugh, you're ruining it. He's being so funny. I'd always get frustrated with the people who would laugh in the sketches. Then I did The Office with him, and I I was so diligent about not laughing. Will Ferrell has like is like has like a predatory sense about comedy where like he would start to improvise in these scenes when we were shooting The Office, and I would feel my face start to rebel against my will, and I would my, and and he has like a, it's like a, you know, like a shark can taste blood in the water from a million miles away. It's like he would like, <laughs> at least in my head, see that, and then it was just like someone leaning on you until you just fell to the ground. I mean, it was like I felt so bad for all those actors on SNL who I'd been like, why are you laughing? It's like it's it's an irresistible force of comedy. It's a tractor beam. I'm blabbing. Basically, I think like, but I'd also seen Will in Stranger Than Fiction and Everything Must Go. And I'd seen Julia in Enough Said and Veep as well. I, and one thing that I like about them both, even when they're doing larger comedy stuff, is that they commit so hard to the reality, however absurd the reality is. You know, Ron Burgundy, you never catch Will Ferrell winking from behind Ron Burgundy, even though Ron Burgundy is an insane character. Um, he's in it and same thing with Julia you know and so to be able to see that level of commitment applied to a more sort of conventionally human story was fascinating and also they've got big tender hearts I mean Will Ferrell I think part of, I was thinking about it part of why I think he's so funny is he has a there's an underlying tenderness actually and like a real depth. He's a soulful guy. And Julia is such a beautiful, beautiful actor and has so many, you know, basements and sub-basements to her personality. And I just think seeing those two up close be so human, it was unreal. I mean, it was, or actually it was real. And that was what was so uh, exhilarating about it. What was it like for you doing these kinds of scenes because there's a scene that is in a nightclub and there's some there's a, a scene directly after that where you are not doing uh, a comic performance you're just being a guy who's there and is kind of supportive and senses what the scenario situation is and what i liked is that 
they didn't have your character veer in any direction that would broaden it too much. He's actually just a nice guy who's there to help in the best way that he can, but doesn't want to get in the middle of it at the same time. Right. Well, there's a scene without hopefully giving out too many spoilers. There's a scene where Will Ferrell is really grappling with the gravity of what he's done. And I'm sort of listening and I think it's connected to what I was just saying. My natural response to Will Ferrell is one of like enormous fondness (laughs) And separate from my admiration for him or my sort of more hero worshipy feelings, I just feel like you just want to give him a hug, you know? So to see him convincingly acting a character who is in real distress, you don't really have to do much acting. You just have to like breathe in and feel what's happening between you two and then respond to that. And that and so I guess the fact that he was so magnetically human made my job really easy. Did they shoot it in tonally in different ways while you while while you guys were shooting? Because they're they are broad comic setups in a way. Like yeah. going to the nightclub and getting drunk is a big setup that could go in a very in a humiliating, embarrassing way, but the movie chooses something much smaller and human. Did you guys shoot other scenes like variations on those scenes in case they wanted to make a broader comedy later? Yeah, I think there was a range of tone. I think that's like a credit to the editor and the directors and and Julia, who produced the movie as well, because they, I think, reined stuff in. We did a scene before, there's like a scene in a nightclub and we're on the street in Austria, but we, we, we were shooting on like a live street in this place called Ischgl, which is like this weird, it's like the home of like Russian frat boys who like to ski. It's a weird, weird town. But we were shooting on the street and they hadn't locked off the street. So it was like me and Will being like drunk on the street. And it actually isn't even in the movie. But there was this weird moment where we were both screaming, like drunk screaming. And there was a woman who had her cell phone out because she was like, oh, they're making a movie. So she had her, her cell phone out and both me and Will Ferrell screamed and rant, charged her. <laughs> So somewhere there's an Austrian woman with a cell phone video of like, oh, they're making a movie. And then Will Ferrell and I, these like tall, weird, fit, you know, just <laughs> like coming in. And to that woman, I apologize. I'm sorry. I want, to, I want to see that video because I want to see where it turns into like a Blair Witch Project thing where she's running away yeah. and still filming We followed it. her for several miles. <laughs> yeah. We got on cross-country skis. We went to her home. She had a wood stove that we poured water on so that it was dark and cold. <laughs> no. No, very little of that is true. Has there been a part of you because uh, you, I don't think you get typecast in a way, but you mainly do comedies. And yeah. Bo- like, I, I guess I wouldn't consider Silicon Valley or Veep or anything broad comedies, but they're comedies. Yeah, sure. You know? uh, is there a part of you that wants to lean into sm- smaller movies like this or smaller performances? Yeah, I mean, the thing that matters to me in comedy or drama or anything is that it just feels recognizably human. I don't like... Um, That's true. Oftentimes you see a big com- comedy actor or action star do a drama, and it feels like a... Yeah. shot at an Oscar campaign of some yeah, kind, and you're yeah. like, this just doesn't feel right or truthful or honest. It feels very ego-driven. Right. Yeah. I'm a bisexual, and I'm addicted to heroin. <laughs> what don't you understand about that? You know, they're like, just I'm cramming I'm fighting for in. my life here, doctor. <laughs> yeah, right. At an accent, like uh, uh, like an uh, uh, identity yeah. struggle, an addiction, throw them all in there, and hopefully gold will be the outcome. Southern accent. It's, <laughs> it's got to it's gotta be a southern accent. Yeah, really. I'm a bisexual, and I have a heroin addiction. <laughs> well, we didn't like you people before, but we sure do feel differently now. <laughs> oh, I'm the one who converts them. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think it's true that, like, I don't want to... I never feel like dramedies that are, like... The, or dramedies. The dramas are that are these, like, kind of weighty, heavy, dark things. Those never feel realistic to me. In the same way that, like, zany kind of, like, Benny Hill style comedy doesn't resonate with my experience of real life. I think real life is a dramedy, mm-hmm. right? At least mm, that's my experience of life. And so I like stuff... What's your yeah. what's your go to uh, rewatch? Oh, great question! I love. I have a few of them. Kramer versus Kramer. Did you like Marriage Story? I did like Marriage how Story, but I'm like, like obsessed a, with Adam Driver. How much did you did you? <laughs> how did you feel it compared to Kramer versus Kramer? It's interesting. I thought. I don't know. I, I guess I feel like Kramer versus Kramer is mostly a story about a father and a son, and I felt like Marriage Story is mostly a story about a husband and a wife, yeah. and. 
The son isn't really a character in Marriage Story. He's mostly just there to be annoying. Yeah, or like sort of like melancholic and like um, sweet. Like he sort of drives home the stakes in a way because he's this like sad, you know, struggling kid. But but right, it's not. He's not the. I think the thing I love about Kramer versus Kramer so much, in addition to just like Meryl Streep, who is just like, oh my god, she's so. Her in that movie kills me. But but um, watching Dustin Hoffman become a dad and them work out this sort of strange intimacy. There's actually not that many... There's not that many movies that are about the tenderness between a father and a son. Mm-hmm. Often it's like sort of great Santini-style stuff where it's like dad's a hard ass or like whiplash, you know, sort of... Fa- That's my boy! Yeah, <laughs> or like, I'm proud of you yeah. after all, you know? But like... S- movies that are about the sort of just like daily sweetness that can exist between a father and a son. There's not actually that many of them. At least if there are, I haven't seen them. And I like that seeing, seeing these two guys come to each other in this way. That's very sweet. So that's one I like ordinary people. I watch again and again. Um, you can count on me, the Kenneth Lonergan movie. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can count on me as, yeah, Ooh. that's probably top three for me. Top three. Yeah. Easily. Uh, lives of others. Oh, interesting. Yeah. The, the Was it Ru- Russian film? Uh, Russian well, it's Czech? East Germany. East Germany. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, o- I've only seen that once since it... Since it it's since not it one out. you really want to rewatch unless you have like a morbid fascination with your own sadness. Um, you Can but, Count on Me is so fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it, Lonergan all, is great all around all of his movies, but there's something about You Can Count on Me where it's like every line works so well. Even lines that are just like when Laura Linney says, you really suck. Yeah. yeah. It is delivered so beautifully and it has you've been waiting so long for her to say something and she doesn't say anything poignant. She just says you suck, which is so believable and honest, you know? I think it one thing um I guess I'm saying a lot of sort of like lofty pretentious N- like fake TED Talk stuff, but I but uh, you have to, if it gets into TED Talk you have to stand up and Yeah, just yes. yeah. <laughs> Jealousy. <laughs> We've all felt it. <laughs> uh, but scientifically, what is it? Um, so No one knows. The end. <laughs> the end. <laughs> uh, I think movies to me that are about people without needing people to be... Okay, okay. I'm coming into a landing for something coherent, I think. I think people are extraordinary pretty much universally like when you talk to people if you talk to them for a second usually people are like extremely strange and extremely beautiful and they don't need much zhuzhing to be interesting i have a friend who's an acting teacher and she's like the thing that is always hardest to teach people is that you are enough Mm -hmm. she's like there's something so boring about watching someone on stage try to be interesting it's the least interesting thing to see someone try to be charismatic or try to be funny or try to be anything. Whereas if somebody just shows up, usually they're irresistible in some way. She, she was telling me like before her students do scenes and they're like setting up the set, she's always like just watching them do that before they sort of get self-conscious and put on their show is riveting. Just watching people move the chairs and do their kind of nervously get, you know, button there. And, and, and I think movies that have confidence in the fact that people are interesting without needing to be, you know, whatever, superheroes or have six packs or be beautiful or be rich or be, you know, just movies that are about like, oh, people are interesting and stop. Those are usually the ones that make me feel good and make me want to watch them again and again because who experiences themselves as like a winner or who experiences themselves as like a superhero? I mean, I love superhero movies. I just mean like, it's not how I feel. So when I see a movie about like Laura Linney and Mark Ruffalo in that, and you can count on me where they're just folks just like getting on with it, you know, like, but that know. said, it's also, in my opinion, it's also still one of the hardest types of movies to get right. Yeah. Because I think so many people, especially, and I don't want to knock an indie independent films in any way, but especially at a certain budget level, think that like, oh, we'll just make a movie about humans and people talking and I have to watch a lot of them. And I'm like, you're missing dramatic arcs here. Oh, that's a good point. The one thing that ordinary people in Kramer versus Kramer have, and you can count on me, outside of just great writing, is that they are very concerned with like classical dramatic arcs and how they perform, how they function in the, within the narrative of the film. It's not just like, 
people, you know, being pe- pe- people. Yeah, that's a really good point. I don't like stuff that's just like verite for the sake of verite, where it's just like a fly on the wall while we watch something that's fairly inconsequential. Yeah. But I guess I just feel like everyone pretty much feels their own life is dramatic, right? Do you? At times, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying that you feel like you should have an audience trailing you all the time, but, but your life feels consequential. It's suspenseful yeah. to you. When you wake up, you're thinking, oh, I hope it goes well today, <laughs> right? <laughs> it matters to you. And I think that's a fairly, right? Don't you guys, doesn't your life feel dramatic? Like, you're not like, oh, change the channel. Or if you do, you have clinical depression. <laughs> <laughs> I wake up and I try to set something up that will reappear for me in the last act of the day. Yes, that's exactly. Yeah. You commit in your daily life to Aristotle's yeah. <laughs> dramatic structure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So I think if you can figure out the thing, like whatever that third rail is in a normal human life, I think it's hard. I've never done it. I've never made a movie like that, but, but like, written and directed one like that but i think do you write do you have interest in in that yeah i do i do write you know what's funny is like i don't know maybe i shouldn't it's probably okay to talk about one thing that i experience i had doing this is like i wrote this um short film and i asked will to do it and he did it after we did this because i was like we were still editing it now who knows if it'll ever see the light of day but it was one of those things where it's like watching him act it's like seeing, I'm not a car person, but I have to imagine like if you're a car person, you see someone drive a, I don't know, Maserati or something. You're probably like, I want to drive that Maserati. And I kind of had that feeling when I was watching him where I was like, oh, I would kill to be able to like make something that he would be in, <laughs> you know? So he was so generous and sweet to me. And he was like, yeah, I'll show up for a weekend and, and do your thing. And so he did. And so it was so fun. It was so exciting. But who knows what will happen was to this it. The, and you directed it? Yeah. And was this the first time you've directed a short? Yeah, it was the first time, yeah. Did it go well? Did you feel good while you were doing it? Were I loved it. Oh, my God, it? it was so fun. Well, you can, you, acting is so much about, like, me, 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 in a weird way. Like, you're not, hopefully it's about listening and being with the other person. But there's a, a way in which, like, your success as an actor is dependent on your ability to, like, have an experience in your body. You know what I mean? Like, it's your face, it's your voice, it's your thing. And whereas, like, directing, at least in this very limited experience I had of it, was, like, it's more like hosting a party where you're trying to, like, set everyone else up to do their best work and sort of stand back, in a way. It feels a little less solipsistic, in a way, for me. There was such a relief, actually. Because you're not fretting about, like... you. you th- uh, there's so much to pay attention to outside of yourself that you have no attention left to turn on inward. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Whereas when you're acting, all of the attention is inward. Well, hopefully... I mean, you're reacting. You're yeah, hopefully it's that. outward, but, there's, but the success or failure depends on your performance. Right. Yeah, I mean, I try when I'm acting to have the attention outward, too. It's just easier when you're directing because there's so much stimuli. You're um, in your third outing with Armando at this point? Or yeah. Or your the third one? Third, yeah. Yeah. What is it, uh, what keeps bringing you back to working with him? Or does he just keep bringing you back? No, <laughs> yeah. He keeps hiring yeah, you. Yeah, that's part of it. But it's more like, I don't know, it's like I'm like a duckling that imprinted on, I mean, that first experience in London was with Armando. And, he, and his way of working is so collaborative. He, like, has rehearsals. And then you show up on set. And, like, typically on a movie set, there's marks. They put little X's and fluorescent tape on the ground. And you have to hit those marks so that you can be in focus with the camera. Um, but Armando doesn't have those. You Even just on Avenue Five, because Avenue Five is much more composed. Composed, that, yeah. Then I maybe here and there, but the 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 feeling of it is kind of like do it every go crazy. I mean, the writing is incredible, so you want to get the writing and everything. But in terms of how you execute the writing, you can wander around, you can try stuff, you can be playful. They rehearse. It's just like this very sort of. Mm, it's a combination of sort of a non-hierarchical creative process with a really confident guy at the helm who ultimately does make all the decisions. And so it's like a pretty addictive way of working. Why is that addictive? Well, because you don't just feel like a human prop. You don't just feel like, you know, a face for the cameraman to bounce light off of. You know, you feel like... It's mostly how you've worked, though. I feel like... Yeah. And I could be wrong, yeah. but most of the shows that you've been a part of, Silicon Valley included, are things that value what you're bringing to set, not outside of just reading the lines. And yeah, oh, for sure. And that's the it's part of the miracle. It's like, again, like if I could get a job just showing up, standing on the fluorescent tape, saying the line while in focus, that's an insane job to be able to do. Like, like 
I could just as easily have to like do something very difficult physically or like that had like crazy hours that was like grossly underpaid. The fact that that is available as a job already is like the greatest job. But then when you're doing it and you get to like bring your ideas and your imagination to bear on the material, it's like, have you it's done disgusting. That? Have you done that version of the, of the job yet? Have you had a gig where you've had to do that? <laughs> yeah, a little, a little bit. Can you say what? <laughs> no, because I'll get in trouble. Okay, fair enough. I, I <laughs> but I have sure. done it. I've done it a little bit where I've been like, oh, I'm just sort of a... Uh, and I get it. Like, I don't mean it as a negative thing. I mean, certain movies have to be made a certain way. Right. You know, like, uh, I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but I'm, you know, a superhero movie has to be made a certain way. Right. Right. They're shooting with like a tennis ball there so they can CG it. You can't like my impulse was to bite the tennis ball. It's like, that's a T-Rex. You can't bite that tennis ball. Like, I don't know why that was the first example. <laughs> I like to have the freedom to bite any tennis ball on set that I want. And so many of these guys <laughs> won't let you chew on tennis balls. Every actor that works with you for the first time is told by the director, like, I'm so excited to work with Zach. I'm a big fan. Like, he's going to bite you in the first <laughs> Just We just think one of his grandparents was a border collie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But when you're in that situation and that um that is the requirement of the job, yeah. you know, what is it, what is it like turning that part of you off that that usually gets to be more collaborative and do that bring that other part? Well, of you out? just feel a little it's funny like I just was talking about border collies, but like someone told me like if you have a border collie, they've been trained to herd sheep. Mm -hmm. So they've got all this like kind of like cerebral enough. <laughs> Dwayne Reed and Walgreens did you know that they're one organization? I guess they are. And they're very impatient. Um, uh, a border collie is easily distracted. <laughs> anyway, basically, like, they're trained to herd sheep. So if they don't herd sheep, then they're, like, they chew the furniture a little bit. You know what I mean? And I think sometimes actors can feel that way. I, like, I've occasionally, rarely, but occasionally felt that way where you're, like, you leave work and you're like, but I still have all this energy and I want to like play, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. And so that can be, you know, you just feel a little less sated at the end of the day. There's also that feeling that I don't know if all actors have it, but it's the only thing whenever I've performed in my life, which is very rarely and I try never to do. And <laughs> thankfully no one asked me to do it, uh, which is that if you are in an uncomfortable place while acting, right, be it the script isn't there or mm. you're not being directed the right way, you feel it inside that something is wrong and doesn't feel right. And so therefore you're operating off of uncomfortable, nervous energy rather than collaborative, calm energy. That's a good point. Or you like sort of resort to your tics, yes. your habits your sort of coping strategies as opposed to finding something new in the moment. I think that's true, actually. It's one of the reasons why I think it's like lucky if you get to work on stuff that you really believe in because otherwise, like, okay, that same acting teacher, her name's Anya Saffer, if anyone's looking for an acting teacher. Anya Saffer told me this thing once. She was like, the key to giving a good performance is finding something to do in the scene that is import more important to you than giving a good performance. So in other words, if I'm in marriage story, if I'm in Kramer versus Kramer and I'm Dustin Hoffman, which I'm decidedly not, <laughs> but if I were him in that scene, that story is so beautifully written that you could probably lose yourself in the fictional circumstances and really care more about getting breakfast made so that I can get to my job, so I can get my advertising contract done. You could commit to that imaginary world hard enough that you would forget, oh, my hands look weird, I've got a weird stick body, I'm like distracted, you know, whatever. Like whatever thing is in your head, whatever internet comment you read. But it's much harder to find something to do in the scene that is more important than giving a good performance if the scene doesn't compel you in some way, you know? I just remembered uh, you said Ordinary People, and you were in Chris Kelly's film, yeah. right? Ordin what was it? Other People. Other People. I wish he'd had the audacity to call that Ordinary People also. Right, it was like, like come at me, bitch. That Oscar <laughs> movie, like, we're ordinary people. Come but, find me, Timothy Hutton. But that was a performance where you were not required to be particular, uh, outlandishly funny or broadly comic in any way. It was just a natural, sm small performance. Yeah, Jesse. that was fun. Yeah. That was crazy. That that that's a scene where Jesse, I can how you can say anything here, right? Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, please no racial slurs. Don't oh, go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then next question. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Please don't take that clip and put it online and maybe ruin the rest in, of my maybe life. Cut it in general because <laughs> no one laughed when I said racial slurs and it made me feel really bad. Well, we're gonna be okay, Ricky. <laughs> we'll be ostracized together. We'll we'll start a co-op farm. You got more to listen to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, what was I gonna say? Oh, th- 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 that scene. It's a scene where I'm having sex with my ex-boyfriend or he's uh, masturbating onto me, which sounds uh, lurid, but was actually quite sweet. <laughs> it was. Yeah. And so it was with Jesse Plemons, who I was like, oh, I mean, he's another one who I've just like, ever since Friday Night Lights, I was like, good Lord, this guy is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and it's fun. It's fun to just like slip into another person's life for a second. I mean, at the risk of sounding, again, like insufferable, but I, I think... You know, one of the one of the things that's a bummer about being a person is you only get to do it once, as far as we know. And it's such a nice thing. Like, you get to do life tourism when you're an actor. Oh, you yeah. get to sample it. It's like being what are you, polyamorous. What's that poly? You know, like you get to like have multiple partners. Yeah, they're yeah. like I'm married, but I have a lot of married. I have a, many, or that's polygamy. But whatever. The point is. <laughs> It's like you're in an open relationship with your own life. Yes, ambidextrous. <laughs> yes, exactly. You get to go and have, you get to like, oh, try this life on and try that life on. And it makes the idea of dying just slightly more tolerable because you're like, well, at least I spent a day as a firefighter. <laughs> I didn't get to do the whole thing. But. How often do you watch uh, television or movies and see like a cliche moment and think to yourself because you're, oh, I would love to do, and it, not cliche in the sense that it's bad, but like, you know, a guy running into a hospital holding someone and being like, does anyone get a doctor in here? Like, <laughs> do you see those and go, oh, why can't I? I want to do that. That's funny. Um, They're so performative. There's such classic performative moments in movies and TV. Yeah, like, you mean, like, this sort of iconic, like, running to the airport terminal to, like, yes. get the girl who... Exactly. I don't think so, because I think I would feel so fraudulent. I think I'd feel like such a putz... Like, I'd know I was, be like, is anyone a because Because I would just have in my head all the other versions of it. Right. Yeah. That could be more interesting. Yeah, that would be more interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to Twitter for a question. Uh, what's your most memorable line from Avenue 5 and Downhill? Well, there was no line that was in both Avenue 5 and Downhill. <laughs> nice, nice try, guys, but <laughs> you're trying to get <laughs> such a stupid answer. Um, <laughs> My favorite line from Avenue Five. I don't. I don't know. That was like a really fun thing to shoot because the guy I'm playing is so. Um, he's this like strange positive nihilist, which I liked playing. But I don't know if there was a single line. Oh, I actually do know. There was in the first episode. There was this little exchange that I always get a kick of, kick out of, where there's a terrible thing happening. The ship that we're on has been knocked off course, and everyone's freaking out. But I'm happy, and uh, Jessica Sinclair an actor on the show she goes why are you so happy and I go I'm a nihilist and she goes no you're not and I go whatever (laughs) and I thought that was such a funny bit of writing that those guys did and in downhill the thing I like most from downhill actually wasn't like like the zingers it was more there's like a that scene with Will Ferrell that felt like um intimate and I like that. So it's sort of all the scene, all the lines in that scene. It, it's a similar thing. It's like with the Kramer versus not comparing this to Kramer versus Kramer, but I'm just saying like one thing that I think you sometimes don't get to see that much in movies is men being tender to men in a way that isn't either eroticized or made fun of, or you know, just the idea that like two men can be gentle with each other without it being either sexy or embarrassing. And I think that. Um, we couldn't help it. It is extremely sexy. Uh, no, just kidding. It's not sexy. I like that. So we have a little tender scene, and I thought that was fun to do. I also like the scene that, um, the, sort of the big scene where we first meet your character and uh, the woman that you're dating at the time, and it becomes incredibly awkward. But what I liked about that is that I think in a lot of comedies, especially American comedies, your performance, your and her performance would have been played for the consistent, like, this is uncomfortable, I'm awkward, I don't want to be here, whereas the two of you, while uncomfortable, were genuinely concerned about what was going on with this couple, and there wasn't much that you could do to help, but you, at the very least, weren't 
playing this one note of discomfort to get a laugh. That's nice. Thanks. Yeah, I think one thing that the movie does well, I mean, I feel comfortable, like, bigging up the movie because I'm a fairly small part in it. Um, but I think one thing that's nice about the movie is there's all these characters who are these sort of eccentric secondary or tertiary characters who initially seem kind of laughable in some way, but then almost to the last one actually have something valid to offer. So, you know, Zach, the character I'm playing, is kind of awkward and uncomfortable with the confrontation, but actually ends up being... Uh, empathic to Will's character in a way that I think is meaningful. Uh, Zoe Chow, who plays my girlfriend in it, is this sort of hard line, it's black and white, there's right and wrong, he fucked up, you should kick him in the nuts kind of person. And in a way, it's sort of laughable. Her certitude is sort of laughable, but then also she's the first person who sort of validates Julia Louis-Dreyfus's rage and hurt. Well, she does an amazing thing by validating it, but then at the same time, going so far herself that she gives Julia Louis-Dreyfus a little more empathy or sympathy for Will. It That's a great that point. That's really interesting. I, I remember, like, years ago, asking a friend of mine, she'd posted something on Twitter that was, like, pretty incendiary and, to my ear, like, mean-spirited. And I asked her, I was like, what is that about? It was, like, a kind of a political thing. And I was like, why? Like, I don't help me understand this. Like, this sounds kind of mean to me, but I know you're not mean. So like, what, wh what's going on? And she said something I thought was really interesting and I probably stupidly hadn't thought of before. She was like, well, she's like, as a woman, you're socialized from a very early age not to articulate your own experience. And that, um, that you should shut up and smile, basically. And sometimes rage is like the rocket booster that gets you out of the gravity of your own sort of socialized repression that you have to scream before you can talk mm -hmm. because your voice is so used to being quiet. So you have to, you know, howl and then, <sighs> then you can talk. And I thought that was a really interesting point point, something I hadn't ever really thought about. And in a weird way, Zoe's character screams which then gives Julia a little room to kind of talk, you know? Yeah. And I to, feel know. like I've been in scenarios like that myself where it's like, I'm really upset about something. I'm ranting about it. And someone validates that and then gives me some sort of advice that is so over the top <laughs> that you're like, oh, I, I, you should kill your boss. Yeah, exactly. He I'm humiliated. Not... No, man, <laughs> buy a knife, <laughs> buy a knife. <laughs> and then you're like, I know okay. a guy. I know a guy. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, you're like, oh, I'm not that mad. Don't right. Like, so like, Let's stop talking about this. I never thought about that. Maybe that's like the advantage of having friends who are like, honestly, man, she sucked. Fuck her. And then you're like, wait a second, wait a second. I love that person. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's like a balance. It like, yeah, that's smart. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, Cameron has a question right here. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed your version of Starman on Avenue 5. Oh, man. And, that makes one um, of us. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, could you sing it for me? Can I sing it for you? Absolutely, but only in the privacy of the hallway. <laughs> it, I will find you after, and I will, no, I probably won't. I so, can I tell you something? Singing, I won't even do karaoke because I find it so mortifying. The only way I can sing it is if I'm like in a character and I can pretend that it didn't happen, like it was like a traumatic fever dream that never actually occurred. So I apologize. I'm flattered that you liked it, but I'm sorry that my own shame prevents me from meeting your request. Uh, next question is from Chris. Right here. I'm a film critic for CG at the Movies, who's oh, also cool. an Office fan, oh. and you're one of the many reasons. That's nice. Thanks. And it, no problem. And in regards to Downhill, what, was fast, what did you find fascinating about the supporting character you're playing? Well, I feel like I'm being a little bit of a broken record, but I think it's a, the fact that it's a guy who gets another guy's back without being a bro about it was interesting to me. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This is interesting. More natural to your life, I would imagine. No, in my real life, You're a I'm bro. like, let's go to Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> let's like hit some Jaeger bombs and let's go fucking. Let's get into all the trouble we can. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on, dude. Let's get tats of uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, Smash Mouth <laughs> on our balls. <laughs> That's what frat guys do, right? They get Smash Mouth tattoos on their balls. That's true. It just it, I all star all over. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Uh, next question is from Autumn. Right here. What a nice name. Yeah. 
Uh, fun fact, we share a birthday, so I wanted to oh. share that. Libras, baby! <laughs> I don't uh, and then my question, I've been going on a lot of job interviews lately, and you get the same questions over and sure. over. Sure. Uh, with both Avenue 5 and Downhill being about disasters and situations gone wrong, uh, can you tell us about a time when you failed and what you learned from it? Wow. I mean, where to begin? I've got... I, I can at least definitely answer times I've failed. The learning part, we'll see. But I, um, times I failed. I mean, geez, there's so many. Uh, I think, okay, well, I just, that's a really like kind of a deep question. So I just want to like think about it for a second. Um, I think I was going to do work on a part once. And I was really anxious because I was like, I don't know if I've prepared enough. I don't know if I'm going to be good, blah, 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 blah. I just think I haven't prepared enough. And someone who's close to me said to me, she was like, well, you're right to be worried. But what you should worry about is not that you won't be prepared because you're always prepared. She said, what you should worry about is that you might never show up for your own life. <laughs> Basically because you're so fret fretful about this stuff. Again, I feel like I'm just revisiting the same themes again and again. But I feel like one way in which I failed a number of times is I had so much anxiety about my ability to perform that I didn't partake in the pleasure of the thing. And I think that actually makes you worse at your job too paradoxically and annoyingly, you would think like being vigilant at least means that you're better at what you're doing, but I actually think the opposite is true. I think if you can sort of give yourself over to something, you're better at it. Um, but that took me a long time to learn and not just a single failure, but sort of oscillating failures. <laughs> yeah, say, do you find that that, because we all say lesson learned after we fail at something, we're like, oh, thank God I learned that lesson. But the worst thing about, really, in my opinion, the worst thing about living sometimes is that 10 years later, you have to learn that lesson again. But <laughs> it's now backed with all the ammo from the times that you've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, Anya Saffer, shout out to Anya Saffer. She told me this thing I thought was so interesting. She's like, you can think of life as like a, a spiral circle where you're covering the same ground again and again. The, the perimeter of the circle stays the same, but you're just going deeper and deeper and deeper. So you're, the struggles are going to be the same struggles, but you're going to have a more nuanced, hopefully, or complicated or fulfilling experience of that same. It's like going down a spiral staircase. And I was like, all right, that. I hope that's true. I hope it's not just a circle. I hope it's not, you know, just like walking in a circle, mall walking. And you're, there's a reason for the nihilism. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, do we have any more questions? Is that it? Oh, that's it. Oh, that's it, Zach. Thanks for tolerating my long-windedness. Thank you for having <laughs> me, Ricky. Coming. What a yes, delight. Of course. Please come all the time. Well, careful. <laughs> anything, anything you have to promote. Come. The short film. Bring it. Oh, it here. thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, Downhill is in theaters this weekend? Yeah, it's a, uh, Valentine's Day. Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, which is Friday, right? Yeah. It's Friday. This Friday, Valentine's Day. I think it's really good. I do, too. I like <laughs> yeah, it a lot. And yeah. uh, Avenue 5 is uh, on Sunday nights on, on HBO, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Right before or after Curb? Yeah. <laughs> Zach Woods, everybody. Let's hear it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>